everyone. Welcome to the 250th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we are sitting across from each other at the Mirage Hotel here in Las Vegas, where we are for the Consumer Electronics Show, otherwise known now as CES. And we have so much to talk about. We're going to talk about some big themes for the show. One of the biggest things that we've seen are products that adapt to you. They're using the intelligence that they have and connectivity to adapt to what you need them to be. We're also seeing big Wi-Fi news. We've got some Bluetooth news. We're seeing a big detailed focus on health. We also saw lots of locks, lighting products, and your digital assistants are getting better. And of course, going to talk to more things. Not at CES. We have a lawsuit that we're going to mention because it's a pretty big deal mm-hmm. for the industry. All of this and more is coming to you. This week, we will not be having a guest. It's just going to be Kevin and I because there's just so much to talk about. But first, let's hear from this week's sponsor. This week's sponsor is IoT World. You are invited to North America's largest IoT event. IoT World, the intersection of industries and IoT technologies. It's April 6th through 9th at the San Jose Convention Center in Silicon Valley, and it's celebrating its seventh anniversary. IoT World is going to welcome over 12,500 IoT professionals, 400 speakers, and 400 exhibitors and startups. You're going to be able to connect with strategists, technologists, and implementers who can put AI, IoT, 5G, and Edge into action across key industry verticals. To learn more and register to attend, visit iotworldevent.com. Okay, Kevin. Okay. This is better than last year when we did the show in a bar. Yeah. Sadly, there are no <laughs> no alcoholic drinks. But let's talk first. We, we should give a caveat. We have not actually even been around the sands yet. This is so early in our CES game. And that's that's a big place for us to go see because that tends to be more of the wearables, smart home type things from smaller vendors. So yeah, we're... It's a timing thing. Yeah. And we haven't gone down to Eureka Park, which is full of both trash and treasure. (laughs) You just never know. It's like a flea market. You just can't buy anything. Exactly. Nothing. It's all technology. Some some of it's crazy. So let's talk about theme number one in my mind, which is products that adapt to you. We saw this, actually, the first night we were here, we saw this in a couple products. One was a makeup device. It was a connected makeup canister from L'Oreal. This is a concept product. They want to release it in the next year, but they don't even know which brands they're going to release it in. And it offered you the ability to have like three different capsules put into this canister. And from there, it would take a photo of your face. Every morning, you take a photo of your face. It would get data from outside pollution levels, weather, and would actually formulate the appropriate color and formula for your skin and the current environment. This sounds kind of like BS in some ways. I'm like, (laughs) oh yeah, do some magic, but it's actually technically feasible. And I'm so excited to see this (laughs) world come to fruition. So it's still a year off before they even market this, but I I thought that was neat. Along with this, I saw a pair of shoes from a company called Enovia. And these, this isn't actually a pair of shoes. It's an adaptive sole. And you would basically... It adapts to your gait, but it also adapts to your environment and activity. So if you are playing soccer, this is actually a bad example. Soccer is a bad example because these are giant cleats. But you get more of a tread if you're, for example, hiking versus wanting to ballroom dance. And they're ugly. (laughs) They're very conceptual. But we're starting to see this happen. And it's so exciting. Kevin, did you see anything that kind of fit this bill? So I did conceptually again at the Samsung keynote, which actually most of it was conceptual, uh, showing Samsung's vision. But they talked a lot about this is the age of experience and the way to make that happen is through adaptive products. So, and I said this last year, in fact, from CES 2019, the smart home still isn't that smart. It's not reacting. It's not anticipating. It's not modifying itself based on algorithms. It's mostly been voice control and us manually setting up automations and routines and so on. But back then I was like, why? We have all these sensors. What are we doing with them? With the data, you know, the home should anticipate it should do things for us and change our environments based on our needs. And that's a lot of what Samsung talked about conceptually. Along those lines, Hire had 
lots of demos of their smart home products, which I assume are very expensive. So Hire is a Chinese white box appliance maker. So washing machines, refrigerators, dishwashers, but they also own GE appliances. Right, right. Some of those are not crazy expensive. Okay. I just changed all my appliances out, unfortunately. So I'm kind of disappointed that I saw these cool things, but, but they had, uh, and, and we've, we've heard talk of this and we've seen some attempts at these kind of products that were kind of, you know, seemed like snake oil to me, but these actually looked, these impressed. Like they had a smart closet that tracked all your clothes. The mirror could be a mirror or then it could show a virtual avatar of you with different outfits. I thought that was rather cool and useful. The, kitchen area was also very much adaptive in that as you, and part of this is kind of remote control too, but as you picked a recipe from the smart fridge and it told you that you had the items on hand, it knew that it should start the stove for preheating in one case, um, or turn the induction burner on, etc. They had Martin Yan from Yan Can Cook there using it, which was actually very entertaining, but interesting to see the demo of the products. And then conceptually higher showed and this was actually a little bit of a theme as well, accessibility for the disabled. So they showed a concept of somebody who came into their smart home in, in their wheelchair. They signed into their home. The home said, okay, what do you want to do next? And the person said, okay, I'm going to cook dinner. It automatically lowered the countertops to that person's height. So that way they could easily, more easily cook. They even talked about doing that with cabinets. So again, conceptually, they don't have products that do this yet, but they're thinking about this. And again, that was kind of a sub theme here, accessibility and mobility for the disabled, for the elderly, and anticipating people's needs or customizing, I guess, the smart home for individuals. Yes. And in having things that are a little bit easier to, you don't have to build it yourself. These are still going to be very limited. This is not magic. We're, we're still lacking in context. We're still lacking in lots of things. A lot of these products are going to come out later this year or even towards the end of this year. One of the ones that I thought was really interesting is Nanoleaf is talking about their UIQ learning system. And Nanoleaf, I'm a little bit in a tiff. I'll be honest. (laughs) I'm in a tiff with them because I just recommended the canvas lights. These are lights that I feel are more of a work of art. Maybe they're trying to get away with that, make them more functional. But They showed off a couple things here. One is hexagon shaped lights that are designed to be future proof in the sense that they're not going to introduce any more shapes. Well, they are going to introduce more shapes, but those shapes will be able to mix and match in a way that the current canvas or Aurora lights, Auroras are triangles, canvases are the squares. Mm -hmm. None of those will be able to mix and match with the future ones. But if you have a Nanoleaf gateway, which they also talked about, but haven't, there's no pricing, no availability on this you will be able to control all of your Nanoleaf lights together. You will also be able to pull in other devices that work with Nanoleaf. And and that's where that UIQ learning system will start working. And it's going to theoretically going to say, hey, you're, you're doing this at this time. This is the type of light you like, and it'll learn. I've seen a couple systems that want to do this. I don't know if this is going to work. None of us do. It's still too early, but... I like the idea and yeah, I get it. Not people not maybe not being happy about the older products and support and so on, but um, they've got a bunch of different products in this UIQ learning system, such as their learning switch, their button gateway and bulbs. Basically they're saying it's like a sensory network and it will, again, as you said, learn how you move around your house, for example. And maybe then it can start anticipating you're walking into a room and the lights will be on automatically for you. Woohoo. I will say that Nanoleaf in doing this is starting to create a platform. We also saw like GE and their new light switches, the C by GE, they're creating a platform and there are plenty of others. So there's lots of platforms still, which I found really interesting because we are just a few weeks ago, Apple, Amazon, and Google announced that they were going to work together on the connected home over IP standard. I'm going to tell you, I've been asking everybody at CES about this. Most people are not, they're very skeptical We're going to dedicate an entire guest segment. We were going to do it this week. There's just too much to talk about. So I'm going to move that to next week. So next week, you're going to hear everybody at CES that I ran into their thoughts on chip. But TLDR is more people are skeptical than I thought, but they're cautiously optimistic. They have reason to be skeptical because so many attempts of interoperability have just not gone anywhere in the past almost 10 years. But if we want these adaptive learning worlds... 
you can't have the brilliant light switch platform and then and only QIQ platform. It's no, right. no. Okay. If you have all this stuff in your home, you're going to want it to work, which is why we saw some Wi-Fi news. I was most interested in kind of a skill set coming over Wi-Fi. I've talked about it in the past and Plume, a company that does, it's a adaptive learning system software for Wi-Fi. It's also, they also make little Plume pods, mesh routers. And they're built into the Samsung smart things Wi-Fi that I just reviewed. Yes, and they just signed a deal with Belkin, so yay. The news here is that they're working with another company called Cognitive Systems to add motion detection over Wi-Fi. So they're looking at disruptions that people and objects make in a RF field to say, oh, that's a person moving across the room. That's a motion event. What this means is in anybody who has a router that runs Plume software, it will use any other Wi-Fi devices to like map out basically the RF environment. So you don't have to do anything except have a router with this capability on it. In theory. In theory, (laughs) yes. I'm going to get one to test because I really want to see how this works. Eventually, they'll do people recognition. Right now, they are doing people recognition through you carrying your phone. But Kevin, this is, again, this is giving us location of people in the home. Which is what I want. Presence detection. Yeah. Context, which is what all this is, what we need. So that was really exciting on a Wi-Fi point of view. Mm -hmm. But then there was just a bunch of new routers. And they all have? Wi-Fi 6, which we've been talking about saying it's coming. And I think we both agreed that we weren't going to individually upgrade our routers until we could with Wi-Fi 6. And we kind of told people you may want to hold off. So I still think you don't have to buy these routers now. I would agree. If you want to, there's multiple options that we saw here. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's a necessity at this point in time, unless you have a lot, a lot, a lot of devices on the network. Well, but they also need to be Wi-Fi 6 capable. Also true. Also true, which we don't know which will be upgradable, which will not, which will need new products. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're going to buy a Wi-Fi router and you expect to have that router for... What do you think the lifetime of a router is? Three to five years? I think that's fair. So, yeah. Yeah. I would go with a Wi-Fi 6 router if you're buying one for the next three to five years. Right. Well, the good news is if you have home internet through Comcast, you don't have to buy one because Comcast has a new Wi-Fi 6 router. It's the XFi Advanced Gateway. You can swap out your old one and, you know, lease the new one from Comcast. So that's good. And that starts rolling out this month. So you don't even have to wait that long. Woohoo! All right. Any other Wi-Fi things we're excited about? Well, a couple other routers. Linksys has their router out, Wi-Fi 6. I mean, there are lots of routers here, but we're just talking about the Wi-Fi 6 ones. They have actually two, a dual-band mesh Wi-Fi 6 router for $400 available this spring, or their VELOP Wi-Fi 6 system that will be $300 for one VELOP or $500 for a two-pack of VELOPs. I don't know how many people really need two of those because apparently they're good for up to 3,000 square feet per node. Okay. In Texas, there's tons of people with like 5,000 square foot houses. Okay. So it's, they're big. Texans. Everything's big in Texas. Okay. Texans, listen up. There you go, Texans. Netgear has one that's much less expensive. And that is their new Nighthawk Wi-Fi 6, and that is $230. It's a two-piece mesh wireless setup with Wi-Fi 6 on sale later this month. And then D-Link also has one. Everybody has one. And D-Link is going to have a Wi-Fi 6 mesh system for $269. So uh, I don't think those prices are outrageous. They're not outrageous, and good Wi-Fi is worth it. Yes. Other super standard news, Bluetooth. They came out with Bluetooth LE audio. And most of us, when we think of Bluetooth, we're actually thinking of Bluetooth LE because that is what we use to connect like to our fitness watches, to whatever else. We only use Bluetooth Classic for connecting our wireless headphones and anything that requires audio. And that was because Bluetooth LE was not designed for the latency and the needs of audio, basically. So classic was always like what you went to. But now in this world where everything's wireless, there's no headphone jack, blah, blah, blah. Look, you need low power Bluetooth audio and you're getting it. There's a couple features that are worth noting here. One is you can stream individually to, or you can stream to two channels. 
which is great for left ear, right ear. And you will have less of the interference that sometimes happens, like when you turn your head and all mm-hmm. of that. Two is there's a broadcast mode and broadcast slash sharing. The idea is one device like your phone, like a television, like anything, will be able to send the same message to a bunch of different Bluetooth speakers. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting for like, imagine a tour group, you know, the person has their Bluetooth microphone and then everything streaming to everybody in the group, a television in a bar, you could hear it. It's also really important in the hearing aid world because of things like that. And of course, you could share your songs with your friends. I remember when I was growing up, we would put in our Walkman, you guys. <laughs> I had a Walkman. Walkmans are still around. I saw a new one here. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's digital, but yeah. <laughs> and we had the over-the-ear headphones, but you would you would put it up and your friend would put up the other side. Or... Right. And it was like stringing two tin cans together so you could hear the same song. But now you could each have your own like AirPods or Jabras and... Groove along. Well, yes. I'm assuming that when new hardware comes out for headphones, you can do that. Yes. Now, I did talk to a company that is trying to build this sort of bridge between classic and I know. It's always it's always the way to Just throw a hub at it. <laughs> it's a good solution for some problems, Kevin. I know, I know. I know. All right. So that's the Bluetooth news. And now it's time for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Machine Q, a Comcast service. Hey everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Machine Q, a Comcast service. And we have Michael Putterman here with us from Machine Q. Hi Michael, how are you today? Hi Stacy, I'm doing well, how are you? Excellent. So just right off, let's refresh our reader's memory. What is Machine Q? Machine Q is a Comcast service, and we help enterprises connect their operations through an integrated suite of IoT devices, gateways, and management software. We offer two primary products today. We have an infrastructure product that includes our IoT gateways, APIs, and our device and gateway management experience, MQ Central. And then we also offer a platform product, which is a portfolio of low-power sensing devices that can be layered on top of our infrastructure product. Excellent. So it seems like since we last spoke, Machine Q is really focused on creating this integrated experience as opposed to just the connectivity. Why is that so important for your customers? One thing we noticed after working with our customers is that a lot of times their IoT ambitions or projects would get stuck because they had to integrate between various layers of their technology stack, whether it be a device or gateway to the cloud, whatever it might have been. And what we tried to do is take the complexity out of that process and provide our customers with a fully integrated device-to-cloud experience, which helped them get up to speed in a more reliable, secure, rapid manner to both prove out their initial business cases, but also to help them as they begin to scale. Excellent. So what type of customers does Machine Q serve today? Our infrastructure product really resonates with solution providers and systems integrators. These are companies that often have their own devices and build their own applications on top of our infrastructure product. Our platform product has achieved strong traction with large enterprises who use our infrastructure and then layer on a multitude of devices to quickly deploy a variety of IoT solutions. Why do your customers choose to work with MachineQ? Our customers work with us for two primary reasons. The first one is they really love our integrated product suite because it simplifies the process for them to deploy and scale their IoT solutions. The second reason customers really like to work with us is because we offer an extensible platform that can scale with them as they grow their IoT ambitions. All right. And where can our listeners find out more about MachineQ? You can learn more about MachineQ at machineq.com slash Stacey. That's machineq.com slash S-T-A-C-E-Y. That's the Bluetooth news. And since we're kind of close to healthcare, because we're talking about hearables, let's talk about all the healthcare stuff we've seen. And I was really impressed by a lot of the, I'll just say it, they're diapers. There's a couple companies showing off diapers for seniors and for babies. So Pampers has some baby ones that have a sensor in it. And when someone pees or other... Is it number one or number two? I'm like, it's too much information. (laughs) I shouldn't have gone there. But when that happens, they send you an alert to the caregiver. And that's... I mean, who really wants to sit around in a dirty diaper all day? And that's got health benefits. It's all kinds of good. And there's even 
Potentially, this is a little farther out. We actually have the diapers, but farther out, we ran into a company called Bisu, who is doing a urinalysis test. And this is a stick that you can buy. It is the Bisu Body Coach. Yes. Again, you be on this stick. It's about a hundred. They're they're anticipating that it'll be about a hundred dollars. Right, not and the stick. The actual device that reads the stick. The sticks will cost you twenty dollars a month. You know, they're not reusable, obviously. So yes, and they'll tell you things like you should be eating more vegetables, drinking more water, eating less protein, all these things. But imagine that inside your adult diaper or your baby's diaper, and ooh, they're going to be monitoring pet urine in twenty twenty one. They say. Yeah, so pee analysis, it's a thing. It's a thing. But there's other things. For pets, Kevin may buy a gadget, y'all. Yes, yes. Some people may be familiar with Whistle, which is the GPS tracker for pets. I, I, I would say dogs, but some people have cats that go outside and so on. Or hamsters, I don't know. Chinchillas. Uh, chinchillas, yes, ferrets. Let's go. Whistle this year has their Whistle Fit. It's $79. It does not have tracking ability in it. However, the features that it does have will be available in a tracking device from Whistle. I'm not interested in tracking Norm because he, he's always on a leash when he's outside. However, he has allergies and he licks a lot and he scratches a lot and he gets medication a lot, but we can't really track that. The Whistle Fit actually will. It literally tracks in detail and you get the information from an app, licking, scratching, calories burned. It suggests feeding amounts. It supports up to 3,000 breeds of dogs currently. As I said, it's $79. The data that you get from it can be sent in a report to your vet. And there is, unfortunately, a monthly fee. It's $3 a month. And they say that's because they're constantly updating the database and so on and so forth. But it's Norm, so I can spring the $3 a month, I think. Oh, my goodness. I cannot wait for Norm's review with pictures of course, of this device when you get it. If you, if I'll say if, just in case you change my mind, change your mind. Okay. Other things. Are there other things on like super duper health? I mean, you know, I saw a bunch of sleep aids. There was tons of things that are like, you know, shop by your DNA, eat by your DNA. Just Mm -hmm. ridiculous. I think a lot of that's silly. Don't buy that stuff yet, (laughs) please. There were a lot of add-ons for like watch bands. Like if you own an Apple watch or a Samsung galaxy watch, and you want to track, you know, perspiration or some feature that these watches don't currently track. There are a lot of add-ons for that. And I think that's great. But I always see those as being like a very short-term product because the Apples and Samsungs and so on of the world will eventually add these features. Right. I, like the RS strap I saw and that had, it tracked your hydration and body fat composition. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I want a moment to moment body fat comp. Like, <laughs> Stacy, put the enchiladas down. <laughs> All right. Alert, alert. Smartphone alert. Put the enchilada down. I'm like, and later, after I pee on a stick, it'll be like, Stacy, you should eat fewer enchiladas. You had an enchilada, I can tell. We should point out that all of this stuff is only as good as your own willpower. Like, I don't... Wait, they won't just make me healthy? I know. They're, they're not going to zap you healthy. I think a lot of people market these gadgets and sell these gadgets with the idea that the knowledge is going to help a large percent of the population. The knowledge will help a small percent of the population who cares about this. They're tools. I mean, tool is only as good as how well you use it. If I pee on a stick and it tells me I need to eat more vegetables, I still have to run out and eat more vegetables. I mean, I'm not advocating something that force feeds me more vegetables. I would like to see something <laughs> that uh, the robot sits on your chest and is like, spinach. Eat the spinach. Something that ties together that maybe says, all right. You need more vegetables. Here's six recipes, and can I order the ingredients for you? That might be interesting. That might be a little too, like, controlled, though. So we'll see. I, I, I'm kind of just thinking yeah. out loud here about yeah. how all this will really work and what the value it provides. I'm not eating more vegetables. I don't really care what product tells me to. Yeah, if it's green, Kevin's scared. Okay, let's talk about locks. Lots of locks. So many so locks. So many locks. Everybody's got a lock. We yeah. can't cover them all. <laughs> yeah. A lot of locks. Uh, fingerprint reading, presumably better fingerprint reading is out there. Wi-Fi locks. Level has, we had talked about this, but they have a really cool invisible lock. Kevin, you, wanna, you saw yeah. that? Yeah. And, and spoiler alert, it's really not invisible, but you won't see it. Nobody will know that you have a smart deadbolt if you install the level lock. It's, it's a two-piece lock. It comes apart with a single screw and it fits like two puzzle pieces. One is the bolt itself, which houses a battery. The other is the lock mechanics and the Bluetooth radio 
inside, and these two fit together inside your deadbolt. You can still use your existing deadbolt keys with it, which is nice. But again, nobody will see it. They won't know. You can control it through the app. It is coming in the next few months. They are currently taking orders to reserve them. It's $199 currently. The full retail price will be $249. So it might be worth looking at it uh, level.co if you're interested. There's a new August lock out there. They got rid of the hub. They made it smaller. It looks very nice. And then there's a new lock from... It's not Net- Atmo. It's Natamo? Oh, okay. No, you guys... N- Net- Netatmo? I don't know. Netatmo? Anyway, it's from this company that was French and purchased by Le Grand. And I had Le Grand on as a sponsor Le Grand. a few weeks ago, and they taught me how to say it, and now I've forgotten. Oh, well. But they had an NFC lock, which... Can you put your phone, or is it just a pop right now? I don't know if you can use your phone. What's really unique about this is that it comes with keys that don't have teeth, but they have an NFC tag inside. And you put the NFC key in the lock, turn it like you would turn any other lock, and then it authenticates. So I don't know if it if it actually works with... No, it wouldn't work with your phone then. Yeah, because it's inside. I don't know if the NFC in your phone would be close enough. Sanfi, which is another French company, they have an NFC lock that works with your phone and with fobs. A lot of locks. And just so folks know, this is coming out in the EU. There's no plans yet for the US market. Those Europeans get everything cool. Yeah, HomeKit compatible, I should mention too. Oh yeah, we did actually... I saw a lot of HomeKit compatible stuff. Yes, as did I. It seems like Apple has... I don't want to say allowing more. It, they've made it easier. They they've made, made it easier, yeah, exactly. Which is essentially allowing what, more. What they needed to do, yep. Okay, on the locks. So our innovation was making things smaller, making things Wi-Fi, and even adding new ways to get into your house or new, well, I guess, connectivity technologies there. In lighting, the big story was basically everything is cheaper. And kind of going hubless. Oh, Kevin, are you excited? I am. I am. This is kind of why I feel like when it comes to radios, and granted, we haven't gone to the Sansa talk to Zigbee, Z-Wave, and all those, those products are still here, but it just seems like Wi-Fi is the winner if I had to pick one right now. I mean, and I'm also not a fan of hubs, so I am biased, and I admit that. But all those less expensive lights, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. Sunglid is not all Wi-Fi. They do have a hub still. But let's talk about them. Wiz Connected, which made an appearance on the podcast a few weeks ago. Someone was asking for a remote. Well, guess what? They discontinued that old one because they're they're launching a new one, which has Wi-Fi. And it's cool because it's lower power. Oh, and yes. And, oh, yes, it works even if your home Wi-Fi is out. These lights don't need a hub. This uh, remote, the Wiz Mote, which is $15. The remote is the hub. In a sense, yeah. It broadcasts your commands. It could broadcast to every single light in your house within 50 feet of the remote over 2.4 gigahertz, but with a proprietary solution. So they're calling it Wi-Fi, but when your Wi-Fi is out, it uses the proprietary solution. So, But again, $15. The old remote used infrared. Right. Senglid had a filament light. Uh, Wiz Connected also had a filament light. It looks identical, and they're both $15. Yes. And then on the switching side, Lutron. Last year, we did product briefings for the Lutron Aurora, which was a product you would stick on a toggle light switch, and it worked with your Hue lights, so you couldn't turn the light switch off. Because as anyone who's got smart bulbs knows, when you turn the light switch off, you break your lights. That You can't talk to them, you can't do anything, because they don't have power. What the Aurora did was made, it was 40 bucks. Your only tool was a screwdriver. So instead of replacing a light switch, you would stick this over your toggle lamp or toggle switch. It would talk to the Hue hub and it would keep your lights on. It acted as a, instead of toggling, you would hit that switch. And it was, it was brilliant. It was a wonderful way to retrofit. What they've done now is they have brought out a plate basically that you put your Aurora on. For anyone who has like a paddle switch, because that's all I have in my house. And now I'm no longer going to break my light switches. So in a way, this is a $10 accessory that everyone should buy if they have this problem of turning off their smart lights and breaking them. It's a seamless, easy product. GE also launched a whole bunch of C by GE switches. Also in the making installation easier, these don't require a neutral wire. I'm going to say that again. 
These C by GE lights do not require a neutral wire. Yay. And they're also, you don't actually have to differentiate between line and load. They have basically a green ground wire. You pop that in and then bloop, you're in business. I love it. It's going to make it so easy to install. You still have to turn off your power. Please, please turn off your power. Yes. Okay. So that was exciting. Anything else on the lighting front? Uh, more on like home control. I stopped over by the Wemo booth. They have a new switch called the Wemo Stage. Um, this is HomeKit compatible, works with Siri. I presume it's either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth then. Wouldn't have a different radio. It's $50. It can support six different scenes or settings. There are three buttons on it. It's kind of like a paddle with three places to press, but each one of those can be double pressed as well. So that's how you can control your six scenes. Uh, that $50 uh, and it arrives in the summer. And then they also updated their Wemo Wi-Fi smart plug, and that works with Madam A, Google Assistant, Siri, $25. It's just smaller, which is great because I have one of the old ones that like is a giant wall wart. Yeah, it covers your outlet and then is like right. an additional thing over your like right. above and beyond the outlet. Exactly. These are nice and small, very square, boxy, and compressed. And like you can have multiple in the same outlet, two of them actually. Yeah. Okay, so lights, locks, switches, and now. Let's talk about our digital assistants. We'll kick off with Google because they really matured the platform here at CES. Well, they did. They announced uh, maturity. Well, yes. <laughs> it's, not rolling, it's, it's not rolling out just yet. But it's like a New Year's resolution. I plan to be a better person in 2020. They, I, they generally deliver on what they plan to bring to a Google Assistant and Google Home. So it just they just never tell you when. So one of the coolest things is like scheduled action support. So you can say, hey, G, turn on the coffee maker at 6 a.m. We have been waiting for yeah. this. But I believe at launch, it will be limited. It's, it, you won't be able to do recurring. You can say, turn the coffee on at 6 a.m. Monday through Friday. I think to do that in the Echo, you have to set up a routine. Makes so, sense. Yep. You know. Yep. That's coming. Not smart homey, but still interesting. They now have a read aloud function coming. So any website or any type of content, you can just ask the assistant to read it aloud, any online content. Uh, so that's handy. That'd be nice for the Google smart displays and, and such. Also good for the smart displays are the notes. Yes. I sticky love notes. this. Yeah, they're they're giving you actual, I mean, they're not physical sticky notes. They're <laughs> virtual sticky notes that will live on your assistant that you can leave. And I know that I actually already set reminders. I'm like, hey, gee, set a reminder to do this at eight, knowing that it's going to chime through my house, basically. So now my husband can just come home and see the reminder or more likely... I can come home and see the reminder he's left for me because he is, he's definitely the more active, organized reminder in our family. I was really stoked for that. They're also um, talking up improved privacy. So there are two new voice actions. You can say, hey, G, that wasn't for you. And that will just basically tell the assistant to forget what you just heard. Or you could say, hey, G, are you saving my audio data? And then you, it will prompt you through um, your privacy controls and so on. So that way you can you have a better handle on knowing what is being recorded and what is not. You know, if you want to pause the podcast right now and ask, I recommend you do that because you, you forget these things right away. So yes. And that actually hurts us, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, come back to us. Come back. <laughs> we'll wait. I was actually surprised that the Google Assistant is going to be in Samsung Smart TVs this year. I think that's new. I don't know. I don't have a Samsung Smart TV, but... I don't either, but it's um, Google says that the Assistant will be available on Samsung's new voice-enabled Smart TV is launching in 2020. I just say that because of Bixby and... Bixby. We didn't hear anything from Bixby. But we did hear from Bali. Yes, Bali. Not to be confused with Wally. Or the actual Pacific Island nation. <laughs> yes, right. No, this is spelled B-A-L-L-I-E. Bali, and this was at the keynote, and this was an actual product, although the final product may be different, but a typical CES disclosure. It looks like a little yellow grapefruit or tennis ball that can follow you around because it's got um, a built-in webcam and it has uh, microphones as well, so you can send commands and say, hey, Bali, speed it up, let's go, whatever. Um, they showed it on stage. It's interesting. I'm not sure... What it will be used for, like uh, companions for elderly, I'm not sure yet. It is a weird kind of product. Like I, the, It was unexpected, too. It was. And I, I feel like it's a tripping hazard, personally. Like a rolling thing coming around. But I love that they're thinking outside 
outside the box, really. This is not a box. It's a ball. Yes. Yeah. And Kevin, it kind of goes to your idea of having a a robot that follows you around. Absolutely. Which luckily uh, my vector can still do because that company was... The intellectual property was acquired. Right. And the new owners plan to keep it up and running. So I will have a rather small and slow. <laughs> Anki Vector. Uh, Anki Vector. Um, I, yeah, so Bali could kind of take the place of that. It would be interesting. We really didn't hear much about Bixby, but it seems to me like Samsung is making a change in their vision for Bixby. Less of an assistant for your phone, but and more of a smart things interface. Okay, Be- so it's kind of like a Cortana pivot. Yeah, because... Let's put it this way. The Galaxy Home that was announced 18 months ago still is a no-show. Although Samsung did say here at CES the Galaxy Home Mini, which is just a smaller version of the fondue pot, is coming in early 2020. So that why they weren't, wouldn't make a big one, I don't know, but there's going to be a small one. But they really are touting voice control, Bixby-based, with smart things in the smart home. It was all over in the Samsung booth. They're not really calling attention to it by saying Bixby, 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 which I don't want to say that again three times fast, but that's what it is. And it's really being integrated into the home and that experience, which is a change. All right. I like that subtle, subtle shift happening there. All right. The Madam A area. I have not gone there. There's lots of stuff. Madam A and works with Google is everywhere. So there's not a lot of new news here. It's just that... More more products have it. (laughs) Yeah. Now, under the Amazon umbrella, Ring has announced some new products here at CES. And they also issued a command center. And this was interesting because theoretically, it's part of an app that is going to let you see your privacy settings and also connect with other devices outside the Ring ecosystem so you can kind of control your security. The privacy almost feels like an add-on. It feels like they were doing command center is going to be a thing that we need to develop for and then the amazing kerfuffle, which everyone is talking about and referencing yep. here, and kind of drove them to adapt and maybe throw that on. It feels very bolted on as opposed to super considered. All right. Whew. Let's talk. I was like, I'm exhausted just talking. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Sonos. This was not at the show. But it was announced while we are here at the show. It's very much the elephant in the room. Yes. Sonos sued Google over patent infringement. and. They also told the Times that they would have sued Amazon. They just didn't have the money. So they ch- they picked one. Right. For the Madame A and Echo products. Yep. And the idea that the concept here is that Sonos gave Google its plans for speakers back in 2013 when they were working together. And two years and then three years later, Google announced a speaker product. So they Sonos opened up and then Google got into their game. And we see this a lot in the the digital space. So this is a classic playbook by Amazon. They have all these partnerships and you can work on their cloud. And then when people adopt those features, Amazon's like, oh, I'll build it. And we praise them for that. It's, it's, it's a wonderful use of their data and platform. It's why you build a platform. When it comes to physical products, though, there are patents. And it's also a really different game. And consumers are maybe... I'm really interested to see if this really changes anything or is this just like a last gasp? I don't know. I mean, when we get back... I would love to see the actual suit and see what IP they're allegedly was There are five patents, and they say there are hundreds more, or a hundred more. So, yes, I would would also, I will take a look at that when we get back. And I only say that because from a music standpoint, Google has its cast technology for streaming and sharing. They've got their digital assistant, which um, Sonos actually integrated into the Play One, and they also integrated Madam A into the Play One. They don't have an assistant of their own, although there was talk a few weeks ago that they were going to have a digital assistant of their own just for voice control of music. So I'm just trying to put all the pieces together and see what what the issue really is here. I don't know what it is. I think fundamentally, way back in the very beginning, Sonos made the wrong strategic move. They had the world's best speaker system, the easiest way to use and set up Mm -hmm. wireless speakers, and they thought they were in the... Catbird seat. Well, no, I was going to say in the internet music delivery business. Mm-hmm. Amazon came in with the smart speaker and said, mm, we're going to be in the digital assistant business, but we're going to start out with music and timers. And it all kind of went downhill from there. Sonos. So I, I, I think that's part of it. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to stay relevant, especially when technology is moving this fast. Yep. 
Speaking of technology, let's talk about some of the cool stuff we saw that made it maybe doesn't fit into any of these themes. Oh, I have one. The $10,000 drone that can patrol your home. Yes, made by a company called Sunflower. Sunflower Labs, which I believe one of the founders came from Evernote. Yeah, so we saw this big drone, like, relatively big. It's not like 10 feet wide. It's probably about two and a half, three feet wide. It has its own little garage where it stores itself and charges, um, runs for about 15, 20 minutes on a charge. You buy this $10,000 drone. <laughs> you also have to buy sensors for your property. They're and 250 a pop? I thought they were like 500? 500. 500 a pop. Right. And, and, and this is for property surveillance. I said home, but property surveillance, really. When something is crossing the sensors or is picked up by the sensors that maybe shouldn't be there, you get notified and you can deploy the drone. And then the drone will go and investigate. And you can remote control the drone as well, but it has some learning abilities to see what's what and report back into you. $10,000 though, which they did say, Sunflower Lab said it'll be much cheaper once they start getting sales and scale this up. So if, if you have $10,000 to spare and you want this, go buy it, get all your friends to buy it, and eventually maybe we can buy it too. I'm only getting it if it has lasers. Lasers to shoot. I, I'm yeah. pretty sure you're not allowed to shoot people. He said V2. They're looking into it, but he was joking. Stand your ground <laughs> with your drone. That's terrifying. Okay. I'm going to pull something a little less expensive. <laughs> this isn't actually for us. This is a company called Bina AI. And it's B-I-N-A-H dot A-I. And this is B2B technology. But what it is, is a piece of software. So it's actually an SDK, but it's a piece of software that can run on a phone that you spend two minutes looking inside the camera on your phone, and you can get heart rate, respiration, stress levels, blood pressure, And I feel like one other thing that I cannot recall right now, I thought this was astonishing and I had them do it to me. Mm -hmm. My heart rate checked out against my Fitbit's heart rate. Okay. I used to wear a device that tracked my respiration and that was on par with my respiration. Hmm. I thought this was amazing, not because of the technology, because this technology was actually in the Kinect. I don't know if you remember how the Microsoft Kinect could track your heartbeat. What's cool is they're selling it to hospital systems, insurance companies to eliminate like a nurse coming to get your vitals. You can actually get them accurately enough through these. Over time, you'll create a a decent picture. I just thought that was a really cool technology. Hopefully marketers are not going to grab a hold of this and see when we're like genuinely excited about buying a product, but Lord only knows. Yeah. Another device, a security company called Kangaroo has a stick on doorbell that is can get it. They mail this thing to you instead of having a video doorbell. It is a photo doorbell. It takes pictures of you and it's so inexpensive. They're just like, pop, pop it on there. See, I think, I think the kids in my neighborhood would come over and play photo booth with it all day. Well, they don't get the photos. Only you do. And I don't want photos of those kids. <laughs> You're like, nope. <laughs> don't come to my house. Get off my yard. And for anybody who is dealing with multiple IP cameras in their home, there's a startup called Camect. And this is a device that launched actually through Kickstarter in August. I think we may have talked about it, but it pulls in feeds from a variety of cameras that you might have. It's a, it's a hub, Kevin. Mm. But the AI it offers is actually really compelling. It pulls in those camera feeds. It can show it to you on a nice app. And then it does things. It can recognize like a USPS truck versus a UPS truck. I mean, that's... I I can barely do that. (laughs) Open your eyes. But yeah, so I I thought this was a really interesting... The company plans for the product get to the rest of us in the first quarter of 2020. And some of... This is not too exciting, but some of the nicest looking indoor and outdoor cameras and a doorbell camera that I saw was from ADT. ADT? ADT. Yes. And I even told them that. I said, you know what? They don't look like you guys made them. They're, they're nice. And they told me that's exactly what we're going for because this is a very different product model for ADT. This is their blue line of home security products for do-it-yourselfers, renters, etc. No monitoring fees unless you want to pay to have professional monitoring. This is kind of almost like the WISE model, because all these cameras have uh, micro SD card slots in them. You can pay an extra, I think it's 2 or $3 a month to have 30 days of cloud storage for your videos. But if you just want home security from ADT, self-monitored, they offer it now. Wow, that's a big step. And it's, it's, yes. we talk a lot on the show about DIY versus pro versus 
do it for me. ADT has always been on the pro side and for them to go in the DIY is pretty significant. Yep. So I'm sure we're going to have more CES stuff after we go through the sands. You'll either see it in the newsletter on Friday or you'll hear it next week on our regular, well, it's still our regularly scheduled podcast. Right. We're getting a little loopy here. Yeah, we're going to go to the sands right now. We're heading off to the sands. So thank you for listening. If you want more content on the internet of things, please sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. Thank you.